Hello, this is Dr. Jim Thomas, and I want to welcome you to Fayetteville First Baptist Online. My hope and prayer for you today is that you're encouraged in your faith and challenged to walk toward a Christ-centered life. If you have any questions about today's message or would like to have more information on what it means to follow after Jesus Christ, please don't hesitate to email me at info at fayettevillefbc.org. I hope you're encouraged today. May God bless you. We all lead busy lives, but if we could just stop everything and take a bird's eye view, a little higher, there, now we can see the multitudes. We are fueled by a shared vision to bring the name of Christ to those who have yet to hear. So we move forward to extreme places, corners of the world that have no access to the gospel. We train missionaries, send them out together, and pray that God's grace be known. We help the hurting, comfort the dying, give hope to the displaced, and have seen thousands come to faith in Christ. We are able to do so much more together than if we were chasing this vision alone. This is our common effort, together. Well, good morning, church family. Stand with us.
We want to invite you to sing this song with us this morning and proclaim just how good he is.
that there will be more of him and less of us. Now please stand.
thankfulness I believe that a grateful heart makes a happy heart and though we every day we should thank God for the things in life that we enjoy and the family and our friends and our jobs and our car and our house but every day we should also wake up thanking Christ for our comfort our peace grace and his mercy I don't know about the future I don't understand some things about the past. I don't know why bad things happen and why some things end and others last. I don't know the rhyme or reason. I don't understand the words some people say. But when I feel your hand of mercy, Lord, protect me from the dangers in my way. I know how to say thank you. I know a blessing when I see one. I'm a recipient of grace through the hours and days I know how to say thank you oh thank you there were times I'm sure when angels stood around me and I couldn't even see and there were times when I was hurting, Lord, and you stepped in and took the pain from me. And there were moments when you stopped me so that I could smell the roses by the road. And though I'm not the wisest person, there are still some things Without a doubt, I know, I know how to say thank you, I know a blessing when I see one, I'm a recipient of grace through the hours and the days, I know how to say thank you. I know a blessing when I see one. I'm a recipient of grace through the hours and the days. I know how to say thank you.
And I pray that as we walk through this season specifically, that we will learn to do that better, to learn to say thank you better, not only to God, but to, the, to those around us. I do want to remind you this morning, uh, we have several ladies that are on a mission trip right now in Orlando, Florida. Today's their last day with the ladies in the shelter there. Uh, I believe they bust down ladies from Jacksonville as well. So please be praying for them as they have this last session. My wife texted me this morning and uh, said two things. Number one, pray for two specific ladies in her small group this morning, that their hearts would be open and pliable to the good news of Jesus. So so if you would just uh, send up a prayer uh, to the Lord to move in those ladies' lives. And the second one was to confirm what I was preaching on today. And she said, now, are you preaching on you shall not covet another's win? <laughs> it's sinking in. You're getting it. For all the Oklahoma fans, congratulations. It was a long night for me last night. And I was wired after the game and could not go to sleep, so I don't know what you're going to get this morning. But uh, congratulations, we'll see you in three weeks. Um, so uh, we're excited about that. And for your team, if you did not win yesterday, then um, don't covet a win today. That's what I was told this morning by my wife. Several years ago, a movie came out called Limitless. It starred Bradley Cooper. And, um, and it was a story, it's kind of a mora morality tale, if you will. This is an out of work, really not out of work, but down on his luck writer who has writer's block. He can't produce anything. He's disheveled. He, he looks like he's living out on the streets in New York, though he's not, though his apartment looks like the streets in New York. And he's just, he just has nothing going for him. He would sit down and he'd try to start typing his novel that he had a contract on. Can't get one fluid sentence out, right? So he finds himself out on the street and hears somebody call his name. Realizes it was a former friend of his and who's kind of got his life together. The former friend used to be a drug dealer. And he's kind of like, whoa, what's going on here? He goes, how's your life? Well, honestly, it's not good. Well, I've got something for you. And Bradley Cooper's character back to, no, man, I'm not going to start into that. No, 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 this is something new. And I guarantee if you just take one. And he was so destroyed inside and so down on his life that he took the sample of that drug and walked away. Well, when he took the magic pill, if you will, not unlike maybe Jack and the Beanstalk, maybe a modern telling of that. He pops his pill in his mouth and all of a sudden his eyes and his mind are wide open. And he starts to become someone other than himself. He cranks out the rest of the book in about four hours and turns it into his publisher who reads it and says, this is the most amazing thing ever. You see through the course of the movie, his character start to grab everything that he desires from riches and power to women, to this, to that, to the other thing. And as this snowball of his life starts to roll, all of a sudden there's a dark shadow that comes over everything. And he realizes that if he doesn't stay on the magic pill, that he won't stay as the person that he created himself to be. And as that happens in his life, you see his life implode on him. You know, how many times do we simply want the magic pill? If we just had what she has, if we just did what he does, if I could play guitar like Chris and Ty play guitar, not so much Matt, but Chris and Ty, I love you, brother. Uh, Chris and Ty play guitar. Man, what could I do, you know? Well, first of all, I can't spend time during the weeks writing sermons anymore. I'll be doing that now. But what if I could do, what if I could just be like, what if I had hair? Well, I mean, how would life be different? And we're always looking for that other thing, that thing that we think is going to be the magic pill that changes everything. And I think we've all been discontent at different times in our lives. And it can be when we're really young, even as an adult or even as an older adult, with who we are and where we are in life. I, that was called my teenage years, right? Right? And we're discontent with where we are, so we try to be like someone else. I always tried to be in the cool crowd, and I made it into the cool crowd. I was on the bottom of the totem pole of the cool crowd, but I was in the cool crowd. I was the doormat to the cool crowd, right? And I tried to act like them, and I tried to respond like them, and I tried to be like them, and I suddenly saw over the course of about two years in high school my life starting to implode on me because of the choices I was making. We wish we had something more. We wish we had something other, or dare I even say, we wish we had someone else. In an attempt to appease those desires, we seek things to fill the gap that we feel, that we feel inside. But can I say this this morning? I believe 
and that God has a greater plan for our lives than we could ever make up for ourselves. You can create yourself in your own image to look like whatever in this world that you think is going to bring you happiness. But in the end, can I just say this, it will fall short of God's best for your life. It just will. Dallas Willard in his book, Renovation of the Heart, once said this, a great part of the disaster of contemporary life lies in the fact that it is organized around our feelings. We live life, we respond to others, we do things based on how we feel. He says people nearly always act on their feelings and think it only right. The will is then left at the mercy of circumstances that evoke feelings. But Christian spiritual formation today must squarely confront this fact and overcome it. This is true with an individual undergoing the transformation of his feelings by Jesus, meaning the emotions, the sensations, the desires. From those he learned in the home, school, and playground as he grew up to those that characterize the inner being of Jesus Christ. He is now not to be one who spends hours fantasizing sensual indulgence or revenge or who will try to dominate or injure others in attitude, word, or deed. He will not repay evil for evil, push for push, blow for blow, taunt for taunt, hatred for hatred, contempt for contempt. He will not be always on the hunt to satisfy his lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, as we see in 1 John 2. Willard says, no wonder he has no real idea of who he will be. And he must be content himself with the mere identity of apprentice to Jesus. That is the starting point from which his new identity will emerge. And it is, in fact, powerful enough to bear the load. We always think if we were just someone else, if I was Brother Andrew's height, man, man, I wouldn't, I, I, I'd stretch all this stuff out a little bit, right? You know, if I just had the hair, if I just had this, if I had this title, if I had this thing, if I had this thing, then this person that I've created in my mind becomes the image that I think God should have created me to be instead of the image that he's created me to be that can best glorify him. And when we understand that title, apprentice of Jesus, disciple of Jesus, follower of Jesus, then we have the greatest title that anybody could have in all of eternity. And because of that, then we can step into that role and live the best life that we could ever live because it's the life God has for you and for me. In fact, Jesus spoke about this in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 36. He's speaking to his disciples and he said, If anyone would come after me, let him get great prestige, great riches, and great titles. Is that what scripture says? It's not. Let me read that again then. Oh, he said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what is a profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And the answer to that question is absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. At the end of the day, the toys go back in the box, folks. Who are you walking with? It really does speak to our key truth, and this is the last message in the series. I challenge you to write this down one more time for the sake of repetition. God will bring it back to your mind someday. And that's this, that God's way is the best way to live life. God's way is the best way to live life. And if you don't know what that way is, go back and listen to the last 10 weeks of sermons online. And today's, too. And you get a clue, maybe, of what this best life looks like. So over these past 11 weeks, we've been studying some of the most well-known verses of Scripture called the Ten Commandments or the Decalogue, which means ten words. And in doing so, we've discovered how to better live our lives in accordance to God's perfect will and perfect plan for us and to be a witness in the world for Jesus. So today we complete this study together, this series, by looking at the 10th of these 10 formative words as we examine the issue of provision. So turn in your Bibles or if you have an app on your phone or device or whatever to Exodus chapter 20. We're going to look at verses 1 through 17, verse 17 being the key text for today. But one more time, I want us to look at this in context and as a reminder of the way that God has called us to live his best life for us. So if you wouldn't mind standing in the honor of the reading of God's word, Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 1, this is the word of the Lord. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. 
You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land and that the, that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. And all God's people said, amen. amen. If you've been with us, you know uh, where we've been on this journey. If you haven't, we've discovered that the first four commandments are vertical in nature, teaching God's people how to properly relate to him. We saw that in verses three through 11. And then the final six commands are horizontal in nature, teaching them how to relate to each other in a healthy way. And so with these last six, first, they're called to honor their parents because healthy families are the foundation for healthy societies. We saw that in verse 12. They're to protect the lives of others. We see in verse 13, because you can't love someone if you kill them. And then we saw this, the idea that guard, of guarding the marriage relationship because when you guard the marriage relationship, the marriage relationship is the foundation for healthy families, which becomes the foundation for healthy society. See how that works? We see that in verse 14. Now with the final three words, we see how to better relate to one another in very practical ways. In the eighth command a couple weeks ago, we saw that we are not to rob or steal from one another, but are to steward God's resources wisely and have generous hearts as we love our fellow believers. In the ninth command last week, we saw that we are not to partake in any form of perjury, which is telling an untruth after making a commitment, and are to have integrity of heart and to speak the truth in love. We see that in verse 16. Now, in the final command, God says this, you shall not covet, and then lists several examples of those things we might desire. So in doing so, he deals with the intention of the heart and our trust in his provision. And so uh, though many of these are fettered out into action, several of the commandments of, this, of the Decalogue really start with the intention of the heart and the mind. And we cannot separate those two things. We cannot separate the heart and the mind from what, how we actually live every day. And we said last week, so many people agree in their heart and their mind about Jesus and then live contrary to that during the week. And the Ten Commandments pulls us back to this accountability that our heart and our mind, our walk with Christ is loving him with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Also with what we do. So we're going to ask this question this morning. It's the same one we've asked for the last 11 weeks just applied to this commandment. And that is this. What does the final command mean and how does it apply to our lives today? So we start with the prohibition. Okay, We start with what we're not supposed to do. Let's write this down. This is our first truth today. We're not to covet. There you go. We're not to covet. We're not to do it. So what does that mean? Well, the 10th command is concerned again with the hearts and minds of God's people. Not only do thoughts and intentions lead to actions for or against others, but wrong thoughts and wrong intentions are wrong in themselves and should be avoided. And how many times do we flirt with something over here in our hearts, in our minds, thinking we'll never act on that thing, but over here we continue to flirt with it because it's not causing harm to anybody, right? But for some reason in that moment, at that time, in that season, it gives us some sense of pleasure. And so we play with that thought over here. We play with that desire over here. And as a result of that, we think, hey, no one's going to be hurt by this until we get back with God. And he reveals that even flirting with those things internally leads us to this idea of idolatry, specifically through coveting. So the prohibition in this command is not to covet. Another word for that would be desire. We see it both trans translated both ways in this text in other English translations and in Deuteronomy 5.21. Now, desire is ethically neutral. You have desires, I have desires. Guess what? God has desires. But 
It is the object of our desires that determines whether it is ethically good or bad, whether the obtaining of it harms others. Richard Foster in his book, Freedom of Simplicity, Freedom of Simplicity says this, at the heart of the sin of covetousness is the inner lust to have. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with having things. It is the inordinate desire, the inner compulsion, the undisciplined craving that is condemned. C.S. Lewis in his uh, little allegorical work called The Great Divorce, which is a, a, a journey, a bus ride from hell to heaven, speaks of a man that he encounters on that journey. And this man walks up and he notices that there's something on the man's shoulder. And as the man grows closer to Lewis's character in, in this allegory, he realizes it's a red lizard. And the red lizard sitting on his shoulder and the text identifies the red lizard as lust. And its tail's flipping around behind his head and the lizard's leaning into his ear and kind of, I can picture the tongue coming out, right? And kind of tickling his ear as he speaks into this man's life. And the man's going, get away, stop it, get, get, stop it, get away, stop it. And the lizard pulls his head back and the tail flips around more and the tongue goes back in the ear and the mouth starts to move, whispering, lustful, covetous thoughts back into his head. It's a very palatable picture, right? Of what we go through, if you will. So the question becomes, how do we get the lizard off our shoulder? We'll talk about that in a minute. But that's kind of what Foster's speaking of here. This, um, this inner compulsion, the undisciplined craving. He continues and he says, but as, but here, and here comes the rub. All of us feel that we are in complete control of our desire for things. We would never admit to an ungovernable spirit of covetousness. We're not gonna take a, a, a poll right here at least today, but if I just said, how many of you are just covetous people? You're like, yes, that's me. Thank you for acknowledging that. We're not gonna do that, right? I, I covet things all week. I covet things all the time. We wouldn't say that. The problem is that we, like the alcoholic, are unable to recognize the disease once we have been engulfed by it. Only by the help of others are we able to detect the inner spirit that places wealth, others, stuff above God. And we must come to fear the idolatrous, idolatrous state of covetousness because the moment, don't miss this, the moment things have priority, radical obedience becomes impossible. When the lizard never goes away, it's hard to listen to another voice. It's hard to listen to the voice and pay attention to the voice of God. Well, then God lists several areas in which coveting might apply. Now, the list that he gives in this final command in verse 17 is in descending order um, of importance. And it's related to the household of a neighbor, which includes all of a person's possessions that are economically significant. And so we are not to cover it several things. First of all, your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. That's kind of a general statement at the end. So it starts with his whole property. Don't cover it. Cover his whole property. Don't cover, covet his wife or his servants or his ox or his donkey. So it's a descending order. He's not making like wife and donkey equal. Ladies, that's when you say amen. All right. And if your husband agreed, never mind. Um, we have marriage counseling available. Okay. It's descending order. But the whole point is the last point, right? The whole point is don't covet what someone else has. Don't run after the other thing. Don't turn your heart and your mind to things that someone else has or who someone else is. Stewart in his commentary on Exodus says that the entire verse is a prohibition against any sort of coveting of what someone else already rightfully has with enough examples given as to leave no doubt that nothing properly owned by someone else can be coveted. Therefore, the people of God are not to desire what belongs to other people, which might lead to the action of trying to obtain those possessions. And that leads us into some of these other commands that we've already talked about. So the prohibition, we're not to covet. So as we've done with these, other, these last three, the two before this and this one, commands, uh, we just can't leave it at that. If, if we're just all about don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, then we're creating a moralistic religion. It's a works-based religion. I'm gonna go out there and try not to do stuff, but I really don't know how to live. It's kind of like when your kids, you, you tell your kids something, you say, don't do that. But you never fill in the gap after that. And don't tell them what to do and how to live. 
then you leave them to come up with that on their own. And just from personal testimony, I'm never good at that. If I know not what, what not to do, and then I try to figure out what to do on my own, it usually comes back to, well, don't do that either. Right? Well, don't, well you told me not to do that, and I tried to make something else up. Well, don't do that. That's as bad as that. I don't know what to do. I think there's a positive corollary to each one of these, and I, we're going to look at that one right now for this one. So we are not to covet. So what is the positive corollary to not coveting? Write this down. It's our second truth. We are to be content. We're to be content. So if we're not to covet, how, do we, how are we to respond to our feelings, which, remember, are like the waves in the ocean. They flow back and forth. Today, you're going to have a feeling right now. In a minute, when I say something, you're going to have another feeling. When you leave this room and you eat some lunch, you're going to have another feeling. This afternoon, you're going to have a feeling. It's called a nap. And then later on tonight, you're going to have, and tomorrow morning, you're going to have another feeling, depending on the weather, depending on how your spouse has treated you, depending on how obedient your kids have been, all that kind of stuff. Your feelings change. So as our feelings are like the waves on the ocean, how are we to respond? Respond to the feeling of wanting more or other. Well, the biblical idea is that of contentment. I'm go- I've given you a, a definition in your notes today. I want you to write it down. It'll be up on the screen. Biblical contentment is this, a conviction that Christ's power, purpose, and provision is sufficient for every circumstance. Biblical contentment is a conviction that deals with faith and trust, that Christ's power, purpose, and provision is sufficient for every circumstance. Therefore, Christ is powerful enough to meet your need. He has a purpose for the reason that you're going through what you're going through, yet he's still present with you and he will provide because he is sufficient to provide. That's biblical contentment. When we can rest in that, everything changes. See, God's not calling us to be unfeeling creatures without hopes, Um, or dreams or appropriate ambition, not desiring a better future for ourselves and our family. That's not what he's calling us to do. In fact, Scripture actually says this, that he desires to give us, or he wants to give us the desires of our hearts, right? But here's the thing. When we live in relationship to Jesus and we start to understand his heart, the desires of our heart will match the desires of his heart. See, I don't think this begins with, I want a Ferrari. I don't think that's where this starts. Well, you said you'd give me the desires of my heart. Yeah, but that's not going to be good for you. And I'm not saying that if you have wealth or if you have a Ferrari, if you have a Ferrari, just give me a ride. That's all I'm asking, okay? But if you have a Ferrari, you have wealth, I'm not saying that's evil. In fact, we'll get to that in a few minutes here in a second. But when that thing becomes the desire of your heart over Jesus, yeah, it's a big red, because that's they all are, most of them at least. It's a big red idol, not unlike a big red lizard. That pulls for our affection and pulls for our attention. You see, the Bible says our problem is not that we desire things, but that we desire the wrong things or desire good things in the wrong way. Did you hear that? The Bible says our problem is not that we desire things, but that we desire the wrong things or desire good things in the wrong way. C.S. Lewis, in uh, in his great uh, essay called The Weight of Glory, gives us an illustration He says this, he says, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. Friday night, we we had our deacons retreat. Brother Jackson did a great job in leading us in that time in an inspiring way, and I had the privilege to be able to speak to our men uh, for a few minutes, and and I went to a text in 1 Corinthians 16, right at the end of Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, the first letter to the church in Corinth. And it's, it's almost like a general or a commanding officer giving instructions to his troops, commands to his troops. And they're very short uh, and, and they're very purposeful and they are commands. And right in the middle of that little section of verses, uh, chapter 16, verses 13 and 14, he simply says this. He says, act like men. Act like men. So th- We've gone through a bunch of this stuff in 1 Corinthians. That was a messed up church, by the way. And he gets to this end and he goes, act like men. Now, he wasn't just saying just for the men to act like men. He was definitely saying for the men not to act like women. But he was saying act like men. But this is what he meant by that, so we can all interpret that different ways. But this is what he meant. He says, stop acting like infants. And stop acting like teenagers. And act like spiritually mature adults. Act like men. Let me put it in a contemporary vernacular, and I said this to our men the other night. Stop acting like you're still in the frat house or in the sorority house 
and start acting like a grown-up. Start walking with Jesus and stop trying to live like you're 21. And I'm speaking to the adults, obviously. Last thing we need in the world right now is another 21-year-old. I got one. I can say that. I love her, but I got one. She's going to kill me. We need you to be who God made you to be at the age he, you are now, in the season you are in now, and act like a man, act like a woman of God, act like a spiritually mature adult. Our desires are not too strong. And though they may seem strong because the lizard on your shoulder is really working hard, our desires are truly too weak. They're infantile. They're adolescent. Lewis goes on. He says, we are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition, when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. The Apostle Paul speaks to this in Philippians chapter 4. He says this, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned, listen, in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now we take that verse, verse 13, a lot in Christian world and we throw it in front of a football team or in front of a squad of missionaries over here or something. We say, go take the hill. You understand the context of that verse? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It's the context of contentment. It's the answer to how we deal with a covetous heart and mind. That when we are content in him, and Paul calls this a secret, uh, let me share the secret of my contentment. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. In other words, the solution for contentment is surrender. The solution for contentment is surrender. It's not coming up with a new plan. It's not trying to make yourself who you're not, who you aren't. It's surrendering to Jesus and walking by the power of his spirit every day. And when we do that, in a, then our circumstances, check this out, then our circumstances become simply the context in which we live out our Christ life. Anybody see the video uh, of Nick Foles this past week? That's pretty powerful. Nick was the quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles, and now he was with the Jacksonville Jaguars. And he, um, he got injured, I guess, this past week, and they did a press conference with him. Now, Nick has been an outspoken Christ follower now for several years. And when he was with the Eagles, several guys got saved. Um, but they interviewed him this past week, and, and someone started with this. I know you're a man of faith, but, well, when they started like that, they ought to have been prepared to get a sermon, right? So they did. And they said, now, when you got the starting role, I know, you were a man, I know you're a man of faith. You got the starting role, and man, you were able to give glory to God and do all this type of stuff. But now that you're injured, how do you handle this? And Nick goes, well, you need to understand the context of my identity. He said, I'm not a quarterback. I'm not a football player. I'm a child of God. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but I'm a, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. Being a quarterback and being on a football team and being in the locker room is simply my mission field. My circumstances don't dictate my worth and my identity. That's solid in Jesus. I'm sitting at home. Uh, one of our members sent me the link to it, so I was watching. I was like passing out an offering plate, giving an invitation. It was awesome. It's like, what a message. And so he said, whether God has me in the NFL for, for another week or another 10 or 15 years, this is simply my context. This is my mission field for living out my life for Jesus. And therefore, I will be content in plenty or in less. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. See, Paul's contentment didn't depend on his possession, his positions, or his pedigree, but only in Christ. In fact, the chapter before in Philippians chapter 3 says this, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. 
For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. In other words, if you read a few verses earlier, you would have gotten his resume. He had everything. He had position. He had power. He had pedigree. He had a purpose. Until one afternoon on the Damascus Road, everything changed. And now I consider all that trash to be burned compared to knowing Christ. Because my identity and my worth and my contentment is not in my circumstance. It's in the person of Jesus. And because it's in the person of Jesus, I am now freed up to live a content life, not coveting after what other people have. And so later on, he writes a letter to another young pastor. His name was Timothy in 1 Timothy 6. And he starts with this robust word. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Woo. And chew on that for a week. That's some meat right there, isn't it? Godliness, following Jesus wholeheartedly with contentment because he is the one that provides for us and is present with us is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And we've seen that in people we love's lives. We've seen that in, in popular culture. We've seen that as they pursue these things outside of Christ, their lives start to implode on them. Back to the movie Limitless, that's exactly what we saw happen in that character's life. He could not keep up with himself and his desires and his life started to implode. And then a very famous text here comes on the next verse. And I want to say it, but then I want to kind of reinterpret it for you. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now, the word money there actually is, is a broader term than just finances. It does mean uh, financial gain. But it can also mean avarice, which means a, a lustful pursuit after financial gain, or actually has been translated covetousness. So I want to read it back to you again with that translation. Listen to this. For the love of coveting is a root of all kinds of evil. Well, I didn't do anything. I'm just thinking about it over here. I'm just, it's just stirring up in my heart and it kind of gives me some pleasure because there's an empty space in me right here. I'm just thinking about it, but it is a root of all kinds of evil. And so when you flirt with the lizard, some point it's gonna bite, right? as you flirt over here with this idea of avarice, covetousness. It is through this craving, Paul says, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Therefore, we're to seek to be content in Christ, trusting in him to provide for every need. So if we are not to covet and we are to learn to be content in Christ, then what should our lives look like? Well, Penny sang about it a few minutes ago. It's our third truth. And that's this, we are to be thankful. You see, when you no longer are coveting after something you're not and yet you don't have, and you find contentment in the one who has you in Jesus, then it changes how you respond to life. It changes your worldview, it changes your thoughts, it changes your heart, and it changes your actions. And it allows you to be a thankful person. So if our contentment is found in Christ, then we are freed up to be thankful instead of covetousness so, or covetous. So what does it mean to be thankful? I meant to get this in your worship guide, this definition for thankfulness. I failed to do that. That's on me, but it's going to be on the screen right now. So write this in. Thankfulness is a combination of attitude and action in response to God's presence and provision in our lives. Thankfulness is a combination of attitude, something internal, and action, something we do externally in response to God's presence because he is real to us and his provision in our lives. And if we can start to learn this mysterious secret of contentment that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, then my life now can be tempered, not with a covetous attitude of what I don't have and what they have and what I deserve and yada, 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 and can be, can be defined by a life that is thankful. You ever met a truly thankful person? They light up a room, don't they? Because they're not concerned about what they're gonna get out of it. They walk into a room and all of a sudden the temperature changes. 
Yeah? And you want to spend time in that person's presence. Now, we've all experienced the other type of person, the unthankful person who wants to suck the life out of everybody else in the room and then walk out. You've been around that person, right? Yeah. And you're walking in and you just kind of feel like your life's like you're sucking the soul out of my body right now because of your great need. But what would it look like the next time you walked into school or into the workplace or into your home and you walked into that place and it changed the temperature of the room because you've learned to be content in Christ and to be thankful for everything. And when that person starts griping about what they don't have, how you can very gently in love correct that and demonstrate God's goodness even in their life that day. It would change everything, wouldn't it? And it would give them a glimpse into what it means to follow after Jesus. Thankfulness is a combination of attitude and action in response to God's presence and provision in our lives. In other words, since God is present and provides for his people, we can trust him in every situation and live lives of thankfulness. Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaks to this in Matthew 6, verses 25 through 33. This is what he says. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. We're gonna take a poll. Anybody, who would consider themselves an anxious person? Okay, the rest of you are lying, um, which is another command. Go online, you can listen to that one, okay? Let me ask a different question. How many of you have had an anxious moment this week? Wow, look at that. We're all in the fold now. That's awesome, right? We do. We have those anxious moments. What does that word anxious mean? mean that It actually has this idea of worry, but it's more than that. Here's what the word anxious means. It means to be divided or pulled to pieces. That's what the Greek, when Greek words always have multiple meanings, but this means this. When you see the word anxious here, it means to be divided. What are we divided over? Here's what we're divided over. We're divided over my circumstance my desire to resolve the circumstance and the circumstance being unresolved. And therefore, I'm pulled apart because I don't know what to do about the circumstance and all of a sudden I'm worrying, I'm anxious, I'm being divided about which way to go here. Do I, do I solve this? Do I work with someone else to solve it? Do I actually go to God and ask him what he wants me to do in this and I'm divided in this? I'm anxious. And therefore, I have a circumstance. But here's, here's the deal, folks. When we learn to live in contentment, it doesn't mean that we don't have circumstances that tests us. But when Christ is our identity, and when Christ is our worth, and we can go to him, and we can hear his advice through his word, through the leading of his spirit, whatever that happens to look like in that moment, then the circumstance will not dictate my faith. My faith will help me determine the circumstance. Does that make sense? And as a result of that, the circumstances don't start to be Lord over my feelings. But Jesus then becomes Lord over my circumstances. And it allows me to become thankful. Jesus says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, by being divided, by being torn apart, can add any single hour to a span of life? The answer to that is you can't. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? And this is key. O you of little faith. Remember what it means to be content? It's a conviction. It's an act of faith. It's an act of trust. That Christ's power, purpose, and provision is sufficient for our every circumstance. Therefore, do not be anxious. Do not be divided. Do not be pulled apart. This is a command, by the way. Saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, those who are outside of faith in God, seek after these things. But listen to this. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. He is, God is not absent from your circumstance. He's not ignorant of your circumstance. He is in the middle of your circumstance and knows what you need. And therefore, why should we turn to him and not try to figure this out on our own? He already knows the answer. So seek him. In fact, <laughs> Paul would say in the next verse, but seek first the kingdom of God, the reign and the rule of God in your life. That's how we define the kingdom of God and his righteousness, a right relationship and walk with him. And all these things will be added to you. You see, the needs of your circumstance don't 
outweigh the need for you to surrender. Why? Because the solution to contentment is surrender. And when we surrender those things to Christ, he will provide for our every need. You ever wonder what God's will is for you? I have, many times, daily even. My daughter uh, led, a, led worship in a Bible study last night for a youth group up in North Carolina, and she called me on her way back uh, to school, and uh, I answered the phone, and it was a great distraction from the game last night, so I thank the Lord that she called, because uh, we were already in the second half. And um, she asked me some questions about God's will. She told me about the weekend and how God had moved and God had worked among these kids and in her own life, and she asked me about God's will. And so we had an incredible opportunity to talk about how we discern God's will for our lives. And there are several different ways that, that we go about doing that. If you ever wonder what God's will is for you, let me help you with one area. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Give thanks. In all circumstances, not just your good ones, not just your comfortable ones, but give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Therefore, if we practice contentment and thankfulness instead of coveting, we will find ourselves in the center of God's will.